welcome to an American Diabetes Month Hits Different Chat. Today, I will be speaking with Libby, a woman who's been living with type 1 diabetes for over 80 years. And we're going to hear a little bit about her life and type 1 diabetes and how things have kind of changed over her life. And so welcome, Libby, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I would love to hear a little bit of background on you, like where you were born and raised and things like that. If you ask the questions, I'll do my she best wants to, to know, answer okay, them. She wants to know when you, where you were born and where you were raised. I was born inside Johannesburg, South Africa, and in 1930, which makes me 81 years, uh, no. 91, 91 years old now. No, you're 92. Ninety-two. Oh, I'm forgetting the time. Um, I was born in a, a, a city equivalent, probably, to Manhattan, but not nearly as big. <laughs> and I was raised there. Oh, that's and, wonderful! And when were you diagnosed with type one diabetes? I was diagnosed with type one diabetes in 1941. I was 11 years old. I had been on holiday in a small country place and I developed a severe infection. Now, whether that's related or not, I don't know, but a few weeks later, I developed the symptoms of diabetes. Severe hunger, absolutely gross thirst, and very quick, massive weight loss. My mother begged me to see a doctor. She was petrified at my weight loss. She put me onto cod liver oil, which I think is probably the worst thing to have done. And uh, when I did not improve, she called in our primary care doctor to the house. Uh, he, even on the history of thirst, hunger, weight loss, mainly the thirst, even before testing the blood, or the, I don't think he even tested blood, then it was the urine, and he diagnosed diabetes, which later was confirmed on a blood test. I was admitted to hospital, a children's hospital, uh, in a semi-comatose condition. Oh, no. And uh, in those days, we didn't have ICU beds or wards. I was put into a semi-private little ward just opposite the sister's uh, room so that they could keep an eye on me. I was put onto an insulin and a drip immediately. Mm -hmm. They kept me in hospital. In those days, they didn't believe in exercise. In fact, that was almost forbidden. Um, they put me into hospital on strict bed rest. I was there for six weeks to get under control. Wow. The, the bed rest, I can't remember, but I think it was roughly for three or four weeks. I wasn't allowed to get out of bed. And they adjusted the insulin. Um, the insulin was given with um, a glass syringe. Mm -hmm. And and a very long, what I remember, a long, thick needle. Mm -hmm. They didn't teach me how to give the injections. Uh, I suppose they did, but we only used the arm. We didn't use the abdomen or the thigh. Mm -hmm. In later life, one learned that one could take the insulin uh, in different parts of the body, arms, buttocks, abdomen, thighs. Uh, I I don't remember if I was um, ultimately discharged on one or two injections a day. They mixed the uh, the regular insulin together with a long acting insulin. It, those, it was called crotal and zinc insulin. Mm -hmm. And uh, what when I after discharge, I remember going home sort of unaware, I was given a three to five year life sentence. They wow. told me that I would die within, the diabetics didn't live longer than three to five years. 
Mm -hmm. The only type 1 diabetic that I ever met in those days was a girl who was in hospital. Mm -hmm. She'd been admitted a few times. Uh, what happened to her, I've no idea. Mm -hmm. But as I say, I lived for, um, instead of living for three to five from, years, okay. I've lived now for well, eight to one year. Um, okay, I'll, okay uh, I'll call you back. Sorry, there's another call. Okay, uh, then I, when I came home, what really uh, sort of upset me was I was put on to severe, without well, really upset me, I was just sent home and it was absolutely explicitly explained that I had to be on diet. Now, I was very lucky that I followed those um, instructions. I, uh, I was uh, told that I had to be on strict food instructions mm -hmm. and insulin. And the food had to be eaten. Now, this is when I was in school. The food had to be eaten at 12 midday. Now, at 12 midday, we were in the middle of class. My mother used to send the maid with a tray of the full diet it had. It was actually measured the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrate, the amount of fat. And I, the teacher put my a chair outside the classroom because mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to eat in the classroom. And I, it was actually quite almost humiliating sitting outside the classroom on a chair with my tray of food and eating it. Mm -hmm. And in, and in addition, missing the uh, lesson. Right. When it, when it came to sport, I wasn't allowed to play sport because they reckon exercise was very bad for a diabetic. So what I did not to feel out of things, I would go and play tennis, but I wouldn't move. I remember standing in the back line trying to hit a ball, which I never succeeded. <laughs> and at high school, again, I wasn't allowed to play sport. Mm -hmm. uh, I was now in what you would call grade seven, grade eight. Uh, I wasn't allowed to play sport. So what I did was I secretly walked around the hockey field to see how much exercise that was. Yeah. And then I decided not to be different to anyone else. I uh, played netball goalie, where you don't have to run, all you do is catch a ball, mm -hmm. which I often missed. <laughs> uh, and so that has obviously changed. Nowadays, one uh, is encouraged to have uh, exercise, <clears throat> not to sit around. So that has been a dramatic change. And mm -hmm. um, then I also lived through the different stages of insulin. I was put on to, uh, I suppose you'd call it regular insulin, quick acting insulin, mm -hmm. long acting, long acting insulin. I can't remember if it was one or twice a day. Now, in those days, to me, I had to be secretive. Uh, my mother brought me up that way. When friends asked me to go and sleep over, I, when I think of it, it was absolutely uh, horrific. I left my insulin at home and um, I went to sleep over and I couldn't wait to get home uh, to go and take the insulin shot. One felt so awful. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, with uh, glucose monitoring, and uh, insulin pumps, it's totally different. And do you use a glucose monitor and an insulin pump now? I'm too old, I believe, to use the insulin pump. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be changed and there are different aspects to it. But I certainly use the insulin monitoring. I use the Dextra G6, mm -hmm. and that has made a big difference in love because one can judge uh, with the dextrose 6 when the uh, sugar goes up or goes down. Mm -hmm. 
and with the uh, and also with the sensor, you can share your results. Now, my daughter, uh, who's an endocrinologist, has actually put me onto her phone, and I often get phone calls from her when she's at work to say your sugar is going down. And then also at night, uh, I've, I feel bad. I've actually woken her a few times. At least my, the phone has woken her to announce that the sugar uh, the, uh, the sugar was dropping. So that is a tremendous advance in, in the uh, diagnosis, treatment, and management. When I first got diabetes, uh, there was no such thing as uh, glucose monitoring. On mm -hmm. you one's urine four times a day, and there was what we, I would call a little spirit lab, which was a little um, flask filled with uh, methylated with spirits, methylated spirits, and you had to light the wick and hold the test tube with Benedict solution, mm -hmm. and. After a time, you saw if the sugar changed. If it, if the color was blue, there was no sugar. Orange, it was quite high. And uh, yellow, it was higher, and orange, it was high. Mm -hmm. And the doctors in those days didn't advise one to be sugar-free. They kept on saying, I should have a green uh, label on a, a result. But I insisted on the blue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been an advance. That was a spirit lamp in those days. Then they developed a strip uh, that one could uh, put in one's urine and check the colour. Then they developed the, uh, there was something else which I can't think of, and now the uh, sensors, the mm -hmm. digital sensors. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all these tell have been the really of, big advancements. Yeah, tell her about the size of the uh, The sensor, I don't know if you know anything about the uh, round, talking about the Dextrose G6, there is, is another make that makes the uh, strips as well. You put the uh, sensor strip, uh, strip onto the abdomen, mm -hmm. and that has a little um, plug over it which you attach, uh, which is called a transmitter. And so one doesn't feel it, or it's just, and it has a tiny needle uh, which goes into the abdomen, uh, preferably the abdomen, they advise, and you don't feel it, but it senses it. If the sugar goes low, it beeps. Mm -hmm. And then you look and know, you see, if the sugar goes high, it has a different beep. And I've often had to get up either to take sugar or eat something sweet, or if it's if you hear the sound that the sugar is going up, to judge how high it is and whether I should take more insulin or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those continuous glucose monitors have really changed the type 1 management for sure over the years. Tell, tell her about the size of the needles. Uh, and then also, the uh, as far as the meals go, uh, as I say, I was on a very, very strict diet, and I've been fortunate. I think, I really think feeling sick when you have the sugar, that I have been very disciplined. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I have, until now, have watched the diet very strictly. And also with the glucose monitoring, the sensors, and uh, one is, one can be aware of how much to eat and when and how much not to eat. Mm -hmm. And if one and also if it, the monitor shows a sign that the sugar is going up, then one knows to stop eating and also that whether one should take more insulin or not. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've learned now that because if I'm going to have a big supper. I take one extra unit of insulin. If I have a small dose, a small supper, I now just take a unit less. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how do you think type 1 diabetes has shaped who you are in today? How oh, has it shaped me? Today? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, 
quite honestly, I don't even think about it because as far as I feel, I've grown up with it, I've been normal, I've led a very normal life. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate. Uh, I went, I was went to our past schooling. I, I became a doctor, which I always wanted to be, even before I was diabetic. Mm -hmm. I had the education. I was head of a, a unit at unit at uh, the Bartlesfield unit uh, as campus health campus. I was head of the health service there. Mm -hmm. So I've been. Either I've shaped my life by being disciplined or mm -hmm. I've been very lucky. But being a, being a diabetic uh, at school, it was hard. I felt different. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very complex. I didn't want my friends to know. Whether they knew or not, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I, I was normal. I tried to be normal and I was normal. Yeah. If we went mountain climbing i held my breath but i went i was afraid to whereas nowadays with the modern treatment i wouldn't be afraid i'd know i'd take with some food if i needed and i'll take and i'll take with the insulin and with modern uh, therapy for younger people if they've got the insulin pump then there's absolutely no hassle Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, you know, type 1 diabetics go, if young people and even old people realize that they are no different to anyone else, that it's not a death sentence as long as they take their uh, insulin and have their food. Yeah, absolutely. If you could go back and tell your younger self, what to expect over your diabetes journey, what would you say? I would say uh, it's a bit of a hassle, but if you look after yourself, if you take your, uh, I think the main thing is watch your diet mm -hmm. and you have your insulin, you are no different to anyone else. And also, I think the most important thing is that one succeeds in whatever one wants to do as long as you work at it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as a type one diabetic myself for 20 years, I love hearing your story and everything you've seen in technology and advancements. And if there is one thing that you wish everyone out there could know about type one diabetes, what would that be? To be disciplined to act normally and not to have self-pity because one is as good as the next person absolutely well is there anything else you would like our watchers out there to know about it about your life and your journey sorry in, just to anything begin. else that you want to tell them yep anything else you'd like to mention yeah i just want to mention that People sort of get afraid when they get diabetes, that's young and old. Mm -hmm. But one's just got to accept it and, uh, and act normally and be normally. For example, I was afraid to get married. I was afraid I was going to die. Uh, what was the point? And yet, we, we, I got married. I, I told my husband, who needed three days to think of, he was a solemn child, he needed three days to think if he should go ahead and marry me. Mm -hmm. And I was told I couldn't have children. I was fortunate I had two children, a boy and a girl. I was told that it was a miracle to have a son, for a diabetic to have a son. I was Fortunate, I was a miracle. I had a son and a daughter. I have now met one or two uh, type 1 diabetics uh, who've had four children. Mm -hmm. In my day, it was absolutely not allowed. 
So there is really no difference as long as one is careful. Mm -hmm. And as long as one realizes, I'm going to say it in inverted commas, that one is not different to anyone else. Absolutely. And, sorry, I was going to say, I think that is the main message, that a type 1 diabetic is as good as anyone else. I have to agree with you. That is a great message for everyone to hear. And I really must thank you, Libby, for sharing your story with us. It's an inspiration to hear what you've seen and the advancements and the changes that have come with your life and throughout the last, you know, 80 years. Um, and thank you all out there for listening on this Hits Different chat. We hope that you found some inspiration and light in Libby's story like I just did. And please keep checking back at the American Diabetes Association social media pages for more stories and advancements all throughout the month of November. So thank you again, Libby, for telling us your story. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Just one more thing that I remember. Of course. When I was high, when, it's actually funny, not then. Uh, when I was half of last C-week and I had a geography exam, well, I had a geography anyway, but, but I failed the exam because I wrote a complete exercise book with the same, uh, <laughs> repeating the same line on uh, the same thing on every line. Mm -hmm. So I got no percent, but fortunately they passed me on my year's work. <laughs> well, that is a great story, and I'm so glad you shared that with us. Thank you so much for telling us your stories and your life, and we really appreciate it. Now, thank you, and thank you for having me, and good luck for you. And you're at this stage of life, you'll live for 100 years. <laughs> I hope you're right. I hope so, too. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure I will be. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome.